is uh, Tony Reedhead's talk. Um, <laughs> I forgot to pull the title up. Uh, Key radio unification steps before 1980 and some related recent radio observations. Thank you very much. Um, well, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I really appreciate the invitation to talk. And it's been a fascinating meeting. And I wanted to add my thanks to those that have been expressed by most of the talkers so far, to the organizers and especially to ICTS. It's been an absolutely fascinating conference. I'm sure it's going to be great. great idea. And, and I'm, I'm showing this picture because um, as soon as I start my, my presentation, it starts doing stuff. Um, but I thought, I thought you might also like to see what, what fun it is sailing off, off the um, Scottish Hebrides. Um, so, so basically, um, I'm going to be talking today about the unification theory, which I think, I think all of you are familiar with. And we've already seen um, these beautiful simulations several times um, of Sasha, Roger, and, and their collaborators. And I gave a talk very like this three weeks ago at the Taurus meeting. Um, and it was very interesting and very different from this meeting. And, um, you know, in unification, there are three critical aspects that you want to uh, use. Of course, there's the fabulous simulations. And then there's all the high energy uh, uh, observations. And of course, this is what was mostly concentrated on in Taurus 2015. This was the Southampton workshop um, actually held in Winchester. And then there's the low energy radio. And what was particularly interesting to me, and what has been very refreshing to me at, uh, in, in the conference this week, what was very interesting to me is, is that um, uh, the, this part of the um, unification story and this part of the unification story were almost entirely absent from this, 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 this conference. And it turns out that that's not, that's not unusual. Um, and yet you have to really consider all three of these because that's what makes the whole unification picture, of course. We've actually seen quite a nice mixture of these, although not, not a lot of that. But it would be nice to get this, uh, do, do more of this together. And so um, something I've noticed is that most people who have written papers and reviews on unified theories of active galactic nuclei over the last 30 years, that since 1985, when the torus was discovered by Ski and Tanucci through some beautiful observations of uh, optical polarization of broad lines um, in narrow line galaxies. Um, <coughs> but all the papers and reviews pretty much have ignored the fact that radio astronomy and VLBI played an absolutely key and pioneering role um, in the development of the story before 1980. Um, there's an interesting, that's an interesting sort of phenomenon, but I think the reason for this is that people just took the radio and VLBI results for granted. It was just part of the furniture when they walked into the room and started working in the field, and so they'd hardly even noticed the furniture was there. They just sat down on the chairs and started using the tables and so on, and took them for granted, right? Um, without thinking about what the implications for unified theories would have been had the radio and VLBI BI results being different to what was found. In fact, the earlier radio and real VLBI results had a very profound impact and have a very profound impact on these unified theories. And I think most of the people or all of the people in this audience are aware of that. But this is going to be um, slightly more pedagogical um, than perhaps um, I would usually um, give a talk, um, because there are also a number of young people in the audience who may not be, be familiar with this. So what I want to do is tell you about these key um, these absolutely key results, which really kicked off unified theories of, of AGN a long time before 1985. Um, by 1967, the Cambridge One Mile Telescope had already mapped a large fraction of 3CR objects. This is more than 10 years before the VLA. And they had found that um, most resolved radio galaxies and quasars have two radio lobes that straddle the galaxy. In flux-limited samples, radio galaxies are generally of larger size than quasars. And at low radio frequencies, radio galaxies and quasars are indistinguishable apart from size. This was very clear already by 1967. And Martin Rao was invited. Oh, here, here are some examples. These are four quasars that had already been mapped by this stage. And they look just like um, um, uh, many radio galaxies, but on smaller scales. 
Okay, and so Martin Ryle gave um, uh, an invited discourse, an invited talk at the IU in 1967, and he said these results suggest that all, those are his italics, powerful radio, extraactive radio sources may belong to the same class, right? And in the same year, the first published explicit attempt at radio galaxy quasar unification was that of Ryle and Longer in 1967. And they published this lovely paper where they unified quasars and radio galaxies in this evolutionary scheme. This is power, this is um, time, and they thought that um, active galaxies started off their lives as quasars and then evolved into radio galaxies. Of course, that turned out not to be the correct, the correct interpretation, but the fact that the radio, the radio results showed that these were such similar objects was forcing them to try to unify them. And I think one of their conclusions here, quoting, no distinction is made between quasi-stellar sources and radio galaxies. It's indicated how both may, be representing, may, may represent different stages in one evolutionary sequence. We now know, of course, that they're unified, but they're not in an evolutionary sequence. So I might have concluded uh, that the distinction of making the first step toward a unified theory of active galactic nuclei um, uh, that distinction should go to Ryle and Longer because of this paper, but in fact, I think that distinction belongs most probably to Martin Rees for the following reasons. Um, at about the same time that these synthesis maps were being made in Cambridge, Bill Dent and others, but Bill was the leader in this field, um, had noticed that um, quasars were showing rapid variability on time scales of about a year. And the lack of synchrotron self-absorption, as shown by their spectra, gave a lower limit to the size of the emitting regions, and this was much bigger than the light travel time associated with the density variations. This was a complete mystery in 1965 until um, Martin Rees wrote his classic paper, okay, The Appearance of Relativistic Expanding Radio Sources. This is as a graduate student, so this would be encouraging to graduate students in the audience. Uh, we've already seen how graduate students can write um, observational papers that have a massive impact on the field. Fanoff and Riley, here we see Martin Rees as a theorist writing a paper as a graduate student that had a massive impact on the field. Not only did he explain this rapid variability, but he actually predicted superluminal motion. And um, superluminal motion was actually discovered over the next few years. The people who really deserve the credit for, um, for seeing it and, and reporting it first were a group of Canadians, Australians, and Al Moffat at Caltech, and the, the published record um, shows that to be the case. Very nice uh, a volume by Tony Zenses and Tim Pearson. Uh, this is discussed in detail. Um, and then, of course, there's Marshall Cohen at Caltech and uh, Erwin Shapiro and, at MIT with his group. So there was good evidence for superluminal motion. Okay. Um, although there was very good evidence, it was by no means accepted by the astronaut community as a reality. There was a huge amount of skepticism of these results because they were all based on models and nobody knew how to interpret VLBI models. Okay, so, the further, um, so this was the first unification paper, I, I would say. So, in other words, um, this is, the, the, you know, 2015 is the 30th anniversary of the Taurus. It's actually the 49th anniversary of unification theories of active galaxies. So maybe we should get together with our colleagues who are studying things from the point of view of the Taurus and have a 50th anniversary next year. Um, I suggested that um, in, in Winchester, but they suggest that they, they, they want someone to volunteer to do it. So all we need is a volunteer. So Preeti, I don't know if you're up for another one of these next year. Um, so um, then further key theoretical steps in AGN unification um, and I'm only trying to pick out the really high points in AGN unification, are, of course, Lyndon Bell's um, um, uh, putting black holes um, in the centers of, of active galaxies and explaining um, them as a source of energy. That was a critical uh, development. Uh, of course, the paper by, uh, by Roger and Martin Rees, a twin exhaust model for double radio sources, was a very important uh, development, and it was the first time that I um, had seen a theoretical um, discussion of continuous supply of energy. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And then, of course, we've got these three classic papers by, by um, uh, Roger blanford Nyack, blanford Knigel, and Blanford and Payne, to which there's been much um, reference already in, in, in this conference. 
Um, okay, so um, what about key observational steps? Well, on the large scale, um, there was, of course, this wonderful map of Cygnus A by Hargrave and Ryle um, in 1974. For the first time, they saw the central component, very important, the flat spectrum central component, and they also saw these hotspots clearly, and they could show that the synchrotron in these lost time scales in these hotspots were shorter than the light travel time from the... From the um, uh, from the nucleus, and so they therefore suggested that there should be continuous supply of energy uh, to these hotspots. So that was a very critical um, step. And um, so this paper came out the same year as the Blanford and Reese um, uh, twin exhaust model. So people suddenly stopped thinking about blobs being shot out in one huge explosion and started thinking about continuous supply. So I was a graduate student. Um, um, at Cambridge in, in um, 1969, and one day sitting down at tea, Tony Hirsch was my advisor and who liked to pose me little puzzles and make me go and think about them. Uh, he said to me, look, in aperture synthesis, the image is the Fourier transform. The, the image um, is the Fourier transform of the complex visibility function, which you measure by an interferometer. And he said, why is the phase more important in reconstructing the image than the amplitude? And he had me completely floored. I sat there and couldn't, couldn't imagine why this was true. But I went away and thought about it. He asked me to go and think about it, so I did. Um, and th here's a nice example that I found that was published later on, 1980. But basically what happens, this is part of the um, uh, pedagogical thing. Look, take an image of an alarm clock and Walter Cronkite, OK? Uh, the famous CBS anchor man. Now, with interferometry, you measure the visibility, which is the Fourier transform of the source brightness integration. So here you have the amplitudes, visibility amplitudes of the clock, and the visibility phase of the clock, and the visibility amplitudes of Cronkite, and the phases of Cronkite. And of course, that's what you get um, with your aperture sensors telescope. And what you then do is you put them into a computer, and you do the Fourier transform, and you get back your image. Wonderful. But what happens if you um, do something a little bit sneaky, and instead of combining the amplitudes of the clock with the phases of the clock, you combine the amplitudes of the clock with the phases of Cronkite, and the phases of the clock with the amplitude of Cronkite. Oh, what, what, what phases of Cronkite with the amplitude of the clock? What do you get in that case? Well, it's very interesting. Uh, you get, um, uh, this is clearly not Walter Cronkite, and this is clearly not an alarm clock. So it's clear that phases are what really matter. And if you just stop and think about it for a moment, it's very obvious why this should be. And when I think back about it now, I'm embarrassed because I should have said to Tony, well, it's obvious, but I had to go and think about it. And if you just think of what an interferometer is doing, and here I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying it and putting it as a young slit. Suppose you're looking at a source at the zenith, and you have your interference fringe pattern, and you define the phase at the zenith. When you've got a source, that's phase zero. Well, now suppose you have a source at an angle theta to the zenith, the phase gets shifted, and the visibility phase is now 2 pi, the baseline length in wavelengths, times the angle of the shift. OK. Now, that's terribly important, um, especially for uh, VLBI um, at all frequencies, and it's absolutely critically important for the EHT. Because, um, so I arrived at um, Caltech as a postdoc in 1974, having had all these questions in my mind now for many years. Uh, talking to Aperture Synthesis with Tony Hirsch and, and, and various people, Martin Ryle and others, Bernie and, and um, Julia Riley and so on. And the first paper I read when I got there was this lovely paper, October 1974, by Alan Rogers, where he said, you can measure closure phase with VLBI. And I'd never heard of closure phase. I thought, what the heck is that? But I went and read his paper, and immediately, of course, the light goes on because I knew how important phase was in order to get the image right. OK, so we then started using closure phase, the first experiments to do this. So let me explain what happens in closure phase. It's very simple. So here's, here's what we've just talked about. And if you've got a little bit of atmosphere above telescope two, it's going to delay the arrival of that wave front. And it's indistinguishable from what would be the case if the source had been moved to this angle theta. OK, so that means that phase delays in the atmosphere corrupt your phases, which is a terrible problem. And this is what led Hanbury Brown in his annual reviews article to say the phases, these were sort of optical and radio, are so corrupted by the atmosphere, you can never use a phase. That was what Hanbury Brown thought. OK, but 
in the visibility phase, the shift in the visibility phase, you see, because of this relationship between theta is just C tor um, over S, of course, so we, we, so we just uh, replace theta there. And the shift in the visibility phase is just 2 pi C tor over lambda. And of course, the delay C tor is a delay over a telescope. And that delay is identical on baseline 1, 2 and baseline 2, 3. So when you form the closure phase by adding up the visibility phases around a closed loop of baselines like that, the contribution, this delay, cancels out exactly. It's not an approximation. So here's the fringes shifted one way on baseline 1, 2, the other way on baseline 2, 3, and they're not shifted on baseline 1, 3 because there's no atmosphere above it. Form the closure phase, this cancels out exactly. This is not an approximation, it's absolutely exact. It's precise. Well, um, if you then apply it, it's amazing how powerful it is. And we started doing this, and Martin Ralph said, nobody's going to believe you unless you do some blind tests. So we carried out a lot of blind tests and, um, and managed to convince the people who could do this. This is the first um, coherent diffraction-limited astronomical image, I think, made at any free frequency with resolution much better than arc second. We made it using closure phase um, at 609 megahertz. We call these hybrid maps. They're now called self-calibration at the VLA, um, but we did this four years before they did it at the VLA. So the hybrid map made from observation of just four telescopes. Here's one closure phase triangle. You can see how good the closure phases are. That's the uncertainty there. And it showed us, um, so here's the beam, nine milli arc seconds, a lot better than one arc second resolution. And remarkably, the first hybrid map said it all. The nuclear radio components of active galaxies are asymmetric one-sided jets. We see it here for a quasar, but then we hit it lucky because we next looked at a galaxy, and please note that, 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 that Roger was part of this observing team. He's, he's often protested that he shouldn't be on this paper, but it's absolutely not true. Um, Warner, Waggett and Warner had made these two beautiful maps at Cambridge with the five kilometer and the half mile telescope. And so Roger um, Marshall and I decided to observe 6251. We had closure phase, and as a result, we could, um, um, we could actually map the central component, and you can see which direction um, it's pointing in. And it's pointing in the same direction as the large scale jet. Okay. That's very important. Without closure phase, we would never have been able to, not only to help us make a better image, but we would never have been able to tell whether the jet was pointing this way or that way. Had this jet been pointing that way, it would have had profound implications for um, unified theories and for relativistic models of what was going on in the nucleus. But everything fitted in rather well. This was the first hybrid map of a superluminal source made in 1977, thanks. Um, there was a lot of skepticism about um, superluminal motion in those days. Um, I can remember having discussions with um, um, Malcolm Longer, Donald Lyndon Bell, Adrian Webster, and Adrian was staying with us I, the day I made this map. I brought it home and showed him, and he said this shifts the burden of proof from the believers to the non-believers in superluminal motion. Lyndon Bell had just written a nature paper explaining superluminal motion as actually not being superluminal at all, but as being two sources that are moving in, in, in the plane of the sky at C apart from each other, so you've got 2C, and then he had to jack up the Hubble constant in order to get the actual superluminal motion we were observing. So Donald's conclusion was that the Hubble constant is 110 plus or minus uh, 10 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So I'm just showing you this to show you that there was a lot of skepticism that even, this, even the phenomenon of superluminal motion was real, right? But once the maps came out and they saw they were one-sided jets, that made all the difference because everything fitted. Um, they're now starting to do um, use uh, closure phase on the VLT. They've got two new instruments coming along, but they're not going to be nearly as lucky as we were because they don't have so much structure to look at. I think in the Galactic Center um, and M87, we're going to be luckier than that. OK, so the next thing that sort of struck our, got, caught our attention was the S4 survey at 5 gigahertz, which showed at 5 gigahertz, um, if you look at the source, you look at the samples, very different low frequency samples, because 60% of the sources have flat spectra, and only 40% have steep spectra, the sort of objects that are being looked at at Cambridge. And for about 18 months, this was a major spanner in the works. How could you possibly unify the extended C spectrum sources with the compact flat spectrum sources? But then suddenly the answer became blindingly obvious. And um, um, we realized that most objects with, with um, with steep spectra were extended objects, and most of them galaxies. 
Most objects with flat spectra were quasars and compact. So in this paper in 1978, we took all of the known observations at that time, which had supernormal motion, I, sorry, had VLBI maps, and there were five galaxies, and um, they all had large uh, physical scale, and there were four, there were four quasars, and they all had... Um, they were all small, and these quasars showed a lot of curvature. These were all very well aligned. And uh, Cygnus A is close to the plane of the sky. 3C236 at that stage was the largest radio galaxy, and 6251 was the second largest. So these were objects that we thought had to be you know, pretty much in the plane of the sky. And in our paper, at that stage, we suggested two possibilities. But our favorite possibility was that this was due to just the angle to the jet axis. And a later paper, we just went back to assuming that. So this is the model uh, that we were thinking of and that we published back in 1980, um, where, um, and this is basically what we um, believe to be true. We were convinced by 1980 that this was the right picture. And it unifies a lot of things. I'm not going to go through all of these, but all of these things are unified by this very simple model. We've got a, a relative, two relativistic jets. Um, and if you're at a small angle, less than one over gamma, you're going to see a flat spectrum um, quasar, or, and um, if you're at a large angle uh, to the axis, you're, you're going to see a galaxy. But there was one thing that it didn't explain, which is um, we were trying to unify radio galaxies with quasars, but it did not explain the fact that radio galaxies have narrow emission lines while quasars have broad emission lines. This completely baffled us, okay? It's 1980. But then in 1985, we had the Taurus results. So that's why to us, Taurus was the last and not the first major piece of the unification puzzle. So, uh, um, so you don't have to take my word for it, because Begelman, Blanford, and Reese wrote this review in 1984, and in their own words, they picked out this powerful unifying theory and gave the right references. Um, Peter Shaw and I had tried to unify um, radio quiet and radio loud um, quasars, um, and the recent findings by Kimball et al. Um, show that there are actually two components to um, this population, and one is dominated by star formation region, and the other is dominated by, um, by the synchrotron radiation. I'm not going to go through this because I'm pretty running out of time now, but basically um, we now know that, I guess, to some extent, our model was correct, but we were using a lens factor of 10, which was fine for the brightest sources, and, but for an for a, um, optically cynical sample of quasars, it's much smaller. So you can go, get over those, those difficulties that way, knowing that there's two, there's two populations. Um, so these do not detract at all from the importance of the Taurus, but that was clearly a major breakthrough. But I do think they reveal a much longer and richer history of the unification of active galaxies than many working in this field today are aware of. So I now want to go on to the Event Horizon Telescope. I think this is one of the most important physics experiments today, but it's not at all easy. And it's, it's, I'm very impressed by the amazing effort um, that I'm seeing you know, Heino and Shep put into this. It's, it's great that they're doing that. Um, so here are some um, predictions of the closure phase um, uh, that you will get. And you can see here what it helps when you add in 10 ALMA stations, how the errors on the closure phase are, are, are reduced. So you now may be able to fit these models. Of course, it would be nice to be able to make actual images. So we only need, um, you know, really good visibility data. Um, amplitudes can be hard to calibrate. How well can you do with closure phases alone? I looked into that in 1988. Um, this was uh, a test object, a bl sort of blind test. And this is uh, an object looked at with 10 antennas, no amplitude information, closure phase alone. This is the reconstructed image. So it's a blind test. I had no idea what, this, what um, my student had set me uh, to reconstruct, um, but we did pretty well. So I think there's no question that you know, the EHT, if we can make it happen, is going to give us great images of the, the galactic center and Sag A star and other objects. Um, We need, to probe, you know, we need to probe the event horizon's extreme sensitivity, and sensitivity is the key. And in the 70s, when we were first doing this stuff, we had large telescopes. We were very lucky. We don't have that many large telescopes to use on the EHT, so that's a problem. So, um, and, and Heino has already pointed out the great importance of Southern Africa. Um, it'd be fantastic to have a telescope here, but you'd really like it to be a large telescope, and large telescopes are important. Well, it just so happens that through a mis misadventure at Caltech, you know, we were part of the CCAT um, uh, project, Caltech Cornell um, 
uh, Atacama Telescope project, but then it was declined, and so we had to drop out of the project. And so Steve Payden decided that he wanted to try to, to rescue us, and um, just to let me give you a little bit of background, we do have some, um, some um, I think, experience in the field. Um, Leighton and Woody uh, designed, Leighton designed, and then with Woody built the six 10.4 meter telescopes um, uh, that were part of Karma, now back on the valley floor. Um, Leighton, Phillips, and Woody built the CSO. This is the cosmic background imager, Payton and me, and then Payton and Carlson built that. Uh, these three telescopes were all built, design, designed and built at Caltech, then disassembled and shipped and reassembled on the site. So Steve Payton has come up with this new telescope, which is a lot cheaper than CCAT was going to be, the Caltech Submarine Survey Telescope. It's a completely novel design. It's freestanding. It has no dome. It's designed for a windy site. It has active control of the surface, very low maintenance. It has limited sky coverage, but I don't think that'll be a problem for the AHT. One radian, in, in, you can choose wherever you want to center, center it, so that's not a problem. And um, it's a 30 meter telescope operating to 345 gigahertz would be 15 million. If we wanted to say have a 25 million antenna operating to 235 gigahertz, it would cost 7 million. That would be if it was built in-house, right? This is if we actually make the panels at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory and we have Dave Woody and Steve Payden help, helping us. But we could do that. We could build it in-house at Caltech or in South Africa or in Germany. Tony Zensis and I are very interested in the possibility of doing this. Um, and of, obviously, if we could do it in uh, South Africa, that would be fantastic. So I'm just going to finish by giving you, pointing to this paper by Steve Payden. A telescope mount with a single point force support at the center of gravity of the primary mirror is proposed to eliminate much of the structure and cost of a large mirror radio telescope. It cuts the cost by about a factor of two. The single point support gives repeatable thermal and gravitational deformation so the surface of the primary can be controlled based on lookup tables for elevation and temperature. Okay. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, questions? Uh... Tony. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> One microphone, I guess. Thank you. Uh, this unification theory means you're, for blazers, you say the jet is aligned close to line outside, right? For the galaxies, it's misaligned. According Blazer, to in blazers, the jet is, a, is, is, is close to the line of sight. Right, right. And in, 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 in large galaxies like Cygnus A and so on, they're at much larger angles to the. You're correct. Observing large angles to the correct, correct, correct. So now, the, actually, the blazer sequence. According to the blazer sequence, what you found is the higher luminosity sources are less lower energy peaked, but the low luminosity sources are high energy peaked. Isn't it contradict to the beaming problem? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not really sure I totally understand the Blazar sequence, I have to confess. Um, and I've never looked at it from that point of view, but that's, a, that's an interesting question. I can throw a comment. Uh, the Blazar sequence, it's pretty clear there's uh, a big range in intrinsic power in addition to beaming, so you have to consider both. Great talk, Tony. Just a comment on the final slide on the, on the telescope. I think it would be absolutely mandatory to go to 345 gigahertz because we'll we run out of sources that we can do with enough resolution at just 230. So soon we'll, there will be a strong... Once this works for a few sources, then there will be a big demand to go to 0.8 millimeters. So it would be great to have a site and a telescope that could do this when okay. you go or when we go for... Right. No, I agree with that. And, and I gave you the scaling there, how it scales with both diameter and frequency. So oh, the other thing I should say about Steve Payden is so far everything that he's done, he's delivered on. And many of the things that he's done, he's done have been completely original. The correlator for the, cal, you know, the cosmic background imager was a completely novel correlator. It worked perfectly. The cosmic background imager itself was a completely novel type of interferometer. worked perfectly. Um, and he, of, uh, he was the mastermind behind the South Pole Telescope. So he's had a lot of experience in doing things and actually delivering. And he delivers on cost and on time. So often you see these blue sky things and you think, oh, well, it's never going to. Steve was trying to convince the Caltech administration that he could reduce the cost of, the C of, of Caltech's part of the CAT by a factor of two. And I, he's one of the few people I would trust on something like that. And and I agree with you, Tony. But we, we, I, and I think we really want to go to 345. OK, last, last question. And then. Yeah. 
see uh, of course tony didn't cover that part see uh, for radio galaxies and quasars when we can extend it then uh, initial barthel's observation was the radio galaxy seems to be larger in size apparent size and number also is larger but now after that any catalog i have examined including 3c back i find there's no difference in angular size of radio galaxies and quasars extended can i comment but yeah okay, okay so um, that's a very good um, observation um, so i have not done this work myself but peter bartel um, you know looked at it very carefully in 1988 you have to be very careful where you select the sample and so and i think that peter did a pretty thorough job so i'd be very interested you know if you if you disagree with peter then i'd be very interested in you know finding out where you think the problems are but you know he did a very thorough job and he did show that there was the expected um, difference in overall size between radio galaxies and quasars i don't know i removed legs also and even hgs and uh, quasars when i compare and there's there's no difference in the sizes in any case Okay, that's very interesting, but I, we should get in a three-way conversation, you, Peter Bartel, and me. That would be great. Okay. Um, actually, we're kind of running out of time for this session, so...